Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, I've done fiction book reviews before. I've done non-fiction book reviews before. But I've never done cookbook reviews before, so it's time to break new ground. This week, I'm reviewing a cookbook. This time one by Jamie Oliver, titled Jamie's Food Revolution. The cookbook, Jamie's Food Revolution, is billed as a tie-in to Jamie Oliver's reality show by, from ABC of the same name. That's ABC American Broadca Broadcasting Company, not ABC Australian Broadcasting Company. Anyway, the premise of the show was that in order to help people improve their diet and their lives by eating healthier at home or at school, Oliver is going to come and teach people nutritious and simple recipes they can cook at home without much culinary experience. The ultimate goal was to make the kitchen less intimidating and to help fight obesity in the most proactive way possible by showing that you, yes you, can cook. Cooking isn't going to break the bank and doesn't require all sorts of ingredients that are expensive, hard to find, or both. It's a laudable goal, and one which hosts of other cooking shows have done before. Good Eats was basically built around the same concept. The main difference between the two shows is that Jamie's Food Revolution was kind of a one-shot attempt to get you into the kitchen. By one shot, I mean one season. Whereas Good Eats was not only trying to get you in there, but also to get you to feel more comfortable there. By building for you a collection of tools that would allow you to cook more dishes and cook better dishes by showing you why recipes work the way they do. Unfortunately, the companion volume to Jamie Oliver's show fails, and fails hard at those goals. The first chapter of this book is good. It lays out what a beginning cook needs in their kitchen and what those things look like. It recognizes that you don't need a full knife set to start, but you do need a paring knife, a carving knife, and a chef's knife, maybe a serrated knife to cut bread. And that's what you need to basically do most things you need to do in a kitchen without having to buy a whole damn expensive knife set. And then things basically fall apart immediately after that. We get to the recipes, and the first recipe of the book involves filet mignon, which is not a cheap cut of meat, and requires you to butterfly it. Butterflying a cut of meat is not exactly what I call a super hard advanced technique, but it's not something I had, it's not something I'd have a beginner do. You need to have steady hands and a sharp knife. And if you don't have either of those, I can remember just both of them, you need both. If one is missing, you're in trouble. If you don't have the confidence to keep the knife perfectly steady and cut straight across, or if your knife isn't sharp enough to cut straight across, what you're going to get is you're going to get an uneven cook. And either not tasty food, because you overcooked it, or you undercooked it, and you're potentially risking getting food poisoning. Both of which are bad. Numerous later recipes in the book are also made for seafood, but not like affordable, easier to find seafood, like the cod or halibut that you find in most freezer cases, or tilapia. Tilapia is a sea, sea a fair amount of, or for that matter, the kind of shellfish that stocks fairly well, like shrimp. But instead, lots of recipes of salmon, which is not an expensive fish for large portions of the U.S., particularly as you get further inland. This got me thinking, and led to me checking out the cook cookbook on Goodreads to see if it had any alternate titles. It does indeed have an alternate title in the U.K., which is where it was released first, as Jamie's Ministry of Food. Then, the penny dropped. This book was originally released in the UK, and was republished in the US, almost without alteration, to promote the new show. Some deeper examination of the book showed some additional UK-specific eccentricities. For example, we got a whole section of the book on curries. Now, this could be just a Jamie Oliver, I'm British, curries are awesome thing. But it is to a certain degree out of place, depending on what ethnic foods are available and what markets where you are. Further, in the first chapter of the book, it gives a list of staples that should be in your pantry. On the list is not peanut butter, which is available pretty much everywhere in the United States, but Vegemite or Maramite. Not only is peanut butter a staple in the U.S., but most, if not all, food banks include peanut butter in their food baskets. By comparison, Vegemite and Maramite are not only hard to find, but they're also fairly expensive as well. Thus, if you're making a cookbook for American audiences to get more people cooking, what you should be putting in there are foods that are staples, that are easy to find and affordable, and which ideally stock well. 
things where you can find it in Oregon, you can find it in New York, and you can find it in Kansas, or Minnesota, or anywhere. Basically, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, South, Southwest, you can find these things. But no. What instead we get is we get a book written for the kind of food that you find on the market sh on the shelves of your s supermarket in Britain, and without trying to redo the recipe, do redoing any instructions or anything, you just change the title of the book and stick it on shelves and can't really be asked to make it fit the market you're selling to. The most we get that's new and relating relevant to the show is we get a new forward. One of the things with the show is that Jamie Oliver, in addition to teaching people how to cook, he also certainly breaks down some of his own preconceptions of the availability of food in the United States and what's available where. And I really wish that that had been placed into consideration when this book was written. Because certainly there are some recipes in this book which are usable. Like, we have a fajita recipe in this book. But it's not put in, like, the 15-minute section. Or, the, or, like, the the quick quick recipe section. It's put, like, way in the back. When the thing is, fajitas and tortillas and all the stuff that's involved in making fajitas is much more available in the United States, where there's a considerable Hispanic population, because it's the continent that Latin America, that Mexico, and all the Latin American countries from there down are is on. Ultimately, this book could have set out to advance the goals that Jamie Oliver put forth to accomplish in his show. Unfortunately, if people pick up this book as their first cookbook after seeing his show, motivated to cook, this might end up setting them back. This might end up intimidating them much more than Jamie Oliver intended to. If you're interested in learning how to cook, you've never cooked before. Alton Brown has put out several cookbooks related to his show. And I recommend picking those up. In addition to that, um, episodes of Good Eats are available on Netflix Instant. There have been several prior DVD releases. And heck, people have put bootleg episodes of the show up on YouTube. Watch Good Eats. Watch lots of Good Eats. Um, each episode builds on each other in interesting ways. But if you're looking to cook a particular kind of thing, grabbing just a random episode works great as well. If it does build off of something else, Alton will give a quick recap of whatever he's covering, like, for example, how yeast works, in addition to referring you back to the prior episode so you know where to look. If you're going to look at this book at all, I kind of recommend looking at it for the recommended kitchen hardware with one difference. One, one other thing in the of the kitchen hardware, which is probably kind of spendy and hard to get a hold of here, but might be easier to get a hold of in Britain, is what's called a grill pan, which is basically a stove pan that has raised bumps on it to, re to basically recreate grill lines, uh, the, the sear uh, of cooking on a grill, and also allowing grease and stuff to drip off the meat and that sort of thing. So you get a certain degree of the lean elements of cooking with the grill. Um, now in the United States, grilling is a thing. It's really easy to find any kind of gas grill or charcoal, gr charcoal grill or... Um, Hell, there's probably a hybrid grill out there somewhere. But you want to, you can get grills. You can't go, like, in the summer, you can't go into a grocery store without tripping over a grill display. So, yeah, but grill pan might be useful for if you're wanting to cook grilling kind of dishes inside without having to go out and say, for example, the super cold weather we have on the East Coast right now. In any case. But those things might be also kind of spendy. I didn't price that particular piece of kitchen hardware. So... I'm pretty scared with this book. It's basically a lot like Porecraft. It's a book which sets out with lofty goals, stumbles spectacularly in the execution, but maybe has some little bits and pieces that are salvageable, but not enough to make it worth the cover price. Next week, I'll be moving into my Nintendo Power Retrospective Best of the Rest episodes, and after that, we'll see where we go. Maybe a movie review? Maybe an anime review. See you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please support the Patreon. Link below in the show notes or in the credits. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, there's a link up above as well. 
If you're also watching this on the YouTube channel as well, you can also contribute money directly through there. I have a donation link there if you want to toss a bit of money in the tip jar. Thank you very much for watching. Mm -hmm.